Hey guys, today I'll show you a sci-fi horror TV series named Stranger Things Season 3. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama takes place in 1984, after the gate to the Upside Down was closed by Eleven, the girl with superpowers. But there were still some who wished to reopen it for research. This group attempted an experiment in June of 1984, using a massive electromagnetic cannon to blast open a connection point between the two worlds. Despite the process looking rather impressive, the result was a failure. Many researchers were lost in the process. The project was managed by a Soviet officer who, after killing the person in charge, entrusted it to a young man expecting results within a year. A year passed in 1985. Eleven and Mike were inseparable, spending every day together hiding in their room. This had been going on for a full six months, much to the dismay of Sheriff Hopper, Eleven's foster father. He felt the children were too indulgent, and to prevent them from crossing any lines, he would always sit in the living room watching television when they were together, casually supervising their behavior. However, this method didn't seem to work. The couple would often sneak kisses behind a wall, and by the time he barged in, nothing untoward was happening. They even teased Hopper over the walkie-talkie afterwards. Apart from dating, Mike, lost in the throes of love, had to find time to hang out with his close friends. On this particular day, the Starcourt Mall in their small town officially opened. It was a one-stop shop for all sorts of entertainment and food. Mike was late due to his date and was humorously impersonated by his friend Lucas, which left Mike embarrassed. Suddenly, Lucas spotted his sister, Erica, squatting on the first floor eating an ice cream cone. The two siblings began to exchange banter, neither one respecting the other. The ice cream came from an ice cream parlor nearby. Steve, having failed his college entrance exams and not meeting the standards to take over the family business, was kicked out by his wealthy father to get some real-world experience. He ended up working a summer job at the ice cream parlor, alongside a girl named Robin. Mike and his friends sneaked into a cinema through the ice cream parlor, fulfilling their dream of watching a Daniel C.C. zombie movie on the big screen without a ticket. Just as the film started, the mall suddenly experienced a power outage. The shot then pulled back to reveal that the whole town of Hawkins had fallen into darkness. At an abandoned factory, the dust on the ground was mysteriously sucked up into a tornado-like shape, scaring away the rats hiding there. But before the audience could figure out why, the power in the mall came back on. Everyone continued partying as if nothing had happened except for Will, who got goosebumps on the back of his neck, reminded of when he was possessed by the Mind Flayer from the Upside Down the previous year. The next day, Nancy and her new boyfriend, Jonathan, woke up to the sound of the alarm clock. They had confessed their feelings to each other, and Jonathan's mother, Joyce, was fully aware of this, but did not prevent her son from dating. The only one in the house who disapproved was Jonathan's younger brother, Will. At that moment, Joyce noticed a fridge magnet had fallen on the floor. She casually picked it up and put it back in its place. Underneath the magnet was a Superman poster of Joyce's boyfriend, Bob, illustrated by Will himself, commemorating Bob who was sacrificed in the previous season. Meanwhile, Nancy and Joyce didn't have time for breakfast. They were rushing to work. It turned out that they were also working summer jobs. As they drove off, a yellow car passed by them. Inside was Dustin, who had just come back from a trip. He was trying to contact his team using a walkie-talkie, but there was no response. When he got home, he was disappointed and sat on the sofa in a daze. Unexpectedly, the robot toys in the house started moving on their own and ran out of the room. Dustin was startled by that, but he picked up a spray can and followed behind, wanting to see what was causing the disturbance. But to his surprise, the robot toys stopped in the living room. The kids' gang then walked out from the side, planning to give Dustin a surprise, but their sudden appearance caught Dustin off guard. Hearing the welcome whistle, Dustin sprayed the can, and Lucas ended up sprayed in the face. He could only be led by his girlfriend, Max, to the bathroom to clean up. Dustin brought from his trip a heavyweight piece of equipment. In reality, it was a large radio tower that could receive clear signals from a long distance. The gang didn't show much interest, until Dustin mentioned he got a girlfriend who was not only beautiful, but also a genius. Dustin wanted to show off his equipment and introduce his girlfriend to everyone, so he planned to use the signal receiver to contact her. To maximize the capabilities of this device, they needed to set it up at a high point. Thus, a welcome party turned into a mountaineering adventure. On the other hand, Max's stepbrother Billy is known for his violent temperament, womanizing habits, and love for working out. He worked at the town's swimming pool during the summer, attracting many girls and women, especially Nancy's mother, Mrs. Wheeler, who had quite the spark with him. 
However, everyone was afraid of Billy, and only when he gave the order could people carry out recreational activities. Not long into his shift, Billy saw Mrs. Wheeler swimming and was instantly aroused. He ran over to ask her for a one-on-one -on -one swimming lesson at a motel that night. Mrs. Wheeler, having a decent family, initially refused without hesitation. But under Billy's persistent invitation, she eventually changed her mind. Meanwhile, Nancy woke up late and had no time to tidy up. She rushed to work at the local newspaper office, her hair in a messy bun and a bag of food in her hand. She shared burgers with her colleagues, all of whom seemed incredibly busy. Even Jonathan was engrossed in developing photos. The academically excellent Nancy felt out of place in this bustling environment. Ever since she started interning at the newspaper, she had been running errands. That day, she boldly suggested a story about the Starcourt Mall, which led to the closure of many small businesses, but her idea was met with laughter. Despite her ambition, she was not taken seriously. On the other side, Sheriff Hopper was struggling to manage Eleven's emotional issues. With no experience in child rearing, he sought advice from Joyce. She suggested that he should empathize with Eleven and talk to her as an equal. Knowing Hopper's impulsive nature, she prepared a speech for him. Hopper wished that Joyce could be more involved, almost as if he wanted to confess his feelings for her and marry her. Unfortunately, Joyce did not share these sentiments and their relationship remained ambiguous. At that moment, the group had just reached the hill's halfway point when Mike suddenly reminded everyone that it was time for Eleven's curfew. This was a rule set by Hopper, prohibiting her from appearing in crowded places or staying out after sunset. However, this rule led to some sweet moments between the two children, which evoked envy in others. After they left, Will felt an eerie sensation again. On the other side of town, in a warehouse, hordes of rats rushed into the basement and strangely exploded into gory splatters. By the time the group reached the top of the hill, it was already dusk. They quickly assembled the radio equipment. Dustin eagerly tried to contact his newly made girlfriend, but there was no response even when the sun set. It seemed like he had been dumped. Lucas even suspected that the so-called girlfriend never existed and was a product of Dustin's vanity. He and Mike did not want to wait any longer and used the darkness as an excuse to head home. Will, who was eager to play Dungeons and Dragons, also left. This left Dustin alone at the top of the hill. Unexpectedly, a miracle occurred. A crackling sound came from the radio and it seemed like a man was speaking. Dustin quickly recorded it. This voice actually came from a Soviet research institute, indicating their research's success and the beginning of the next phase of their plan. They sent out a coded telegram. However, just as the plot began to unfold, the town remained peaceful. Joyce, back home, couldn't help but reminisce about her late boyfriend, Bob. Hopper, lying in bed, was rehearsing a script. Once mentally prepared, he intended to knock on Eleven's door. Unfortunately, his decisive action fell short in his speech. He discarded the script prepared by Joyce, stuttering for a while before deciding to proceed in his own way. Using an incident involving Mike's grandma as an excuse, he tricked Mike into a private chat in his car. He claimed that if Mike wanted to continue dating Eleven, he would have to respect the rules set by him. Mike had no choice but to agree to be driven home by him. Meanwhile, Mrs. Wheeler was at home, dressing up, preparing for a secret rendezvous with Billy at a motel. However, upon seeing her sleeping husband and daughter in the living room, she reconsidered and decided to stay at home. On the other hand, Billy was excitedly speeding on the road in anticipation of their meeting. But something dashed out from the side of the road, smashing his windshield. Billy swerved to avoid it, causing his car to stall momentarily. But when he got out to check, he saw a viscous fluid on his windshield. Immediately, a flesh vine emerged from the darkness, wrapping around his leg and pulling him into the basement of a warehouse. Billy was not killed. He managed to escape, hastily drove away, and called the police from a nearby phone booth. Suddenly, he had some flashes in his mind. It turned out that he didn't escape on his own. The vine had crawled onto his face and seemed to have injected something into him before releasing him. The light in the phone booth flickered. He saw the outside world become the upside down, filled with floating debris. A group of people emerged from the darkness. One of them looked exactly like him. Billy panicked, asking them what they wanted. The other party only answered with an inexplicable sentence, then disappeared, leaving Billy stunned on the spot. Meanwhile, Nancy was still cleaning the newspaper office. The phone suddenly rang and she picked it up. She learned that an old woman named Driscoll had a rat infestation at home. Nancy wrote down the old woman's address on a sticky note and pondered over it all night. She couldn't shake off her worries, so the next day she asked the editor-in-chief for a day off. She found Jonathan and planned to interview Mrs. Driscoll as a reporter. Although Jonathan suggested that Nancy should seek the editor's opinion first, he still accompanied her. 
Mrs. Driscoll was a widow. She led Nancy and Jonathan into the basement, where they saw that the bags of fertilizer stored inside had been damaged. The bags had small teeth marks and were half empty, apparently eaten by rats. Nancy initially didn't believe Mrs. Driscoll, but she had caught the thief and claimed that the rats had rabies. Just as she finished speaking, they heard a loud crash from deep within. A furious rat was inside a small cage. Jonathan quickly took a photo as evidence, while Nancy called pest control and stores to inquire about similar rat problems. She quickly found a new clue and left Mrs. Driscoll's house with Jonathan. However, after they left, the light in the basement began to flicker. The rat in the cage was in great pain and soon exploded into a pile of meat. But even though the rat died, the meat was still alive. It quickly crawled out of the cage, and when it hit the ground, it grew legs and escaped into the shadows. As a series of strange incidents unfolded, the young crew was still caught up in love. Eleven woke up early in the morning but didn't find Mike. She called him to ask what happened. Mike, who had been threatened by Hopper, couldn't reveal the truth and had to lie. He told her that he wasn't unwilling to see her, but that his grandmother was genuinely ill and he had to go to the nursing home to take care of her. Their conversation was overheard by Mrs. Wheeler, who was surprised that she didn't know about her mother's critical illness. As a result, Eleven heard the conversation and questioned Mike if he was lying. Worried about being exposed, Mike had no choice but to make up an excuse and hang up the phone. Hopper, who had been watching the whole time, was thrilled. He had finally managed to break up the two kids. He then skipped the police station and drove straight to Joyce's house to share the good news, praising her method as effective. Consequently, he invited Joyce to dinner that night. Joyce thought he had talked things over with the kids. Unbeknownst to her, he improvised and used a threatening tactic. Therefore, she agreed to his proposal. However, when Hopper left, a fridge magnet fell to the floor, as if it had lost its magnetism. To figure out why, Joyce checked a large stack of electromagnetic materials, but had difficulty understanding them. So she took the books to her son's teacher, asking for help to identify the problem. Meanwhile, Hopper went to the city hall. It turned out that the mayor had pushed for a mall, causing many small shops to close and people to lose their jobs. As a result, they gathered in front of City Hall to protest. The mayor wanted Hopper to disperse the crowd, but Hopper wasn't interested in politics. However, the protesters didn't have a permit, and for a moment of peace, he reluctantly arrested the main instigator. On the other side, Eleven was dealing with relationship issues for the first time and turned to Max for advice, hoping she could provide some insight. Max suggested they break up, not giving Mike a chance. But to ease Eleven's feelings, Max took her to the Star Court Mall. Though it was against Hopper's rules, Eleven was dazzled by the vibrant world and enjoyed shopping with Max. Mike, Lucas, and Will were also wandering around the mall. They wanted to buy a gift for Eleven as an apology, but they didn't have much money and had to leave dejectedly. They unexpectedly bumped into Eleven and things didn't end well. Mike didn't dare to explain to Eleven and was publicly dumped, leaving him stunned. Dustin didn't hang out with this group. He found Steve, who was working at the ice cream parlor. Besides catching up with him, he informed Steve that he had intercepted Soviet intelligence and wanted to use it to gain prestige. But first, they had to translate the intelligence. As a result, Steve left all the work to Robin and hid in the back room with Dustin to listen to the recording. But they didn't understand Russian, and even with a dictionary, they couldn't make sense of it. They were just familiar with the background noise until Robin, irritated, came to kick them out. She couldn't stand their nonsense guessing. Robin had been in a band for 12 years, had excellent hearing, and could speak four languages. Therefore, she volunteered to take over the translation work. Although the translation process was challenging, she had some knowledge. By the end of her shift, she had successfully translated it. However, the intelligence was encoded, and they needed to decode it to understand the specific content. While Robin and Dustin were discussing, Steve suddenly gave a coin to a mechanical horse. As the horse moved, a familiar tune came out, which matched the background sound of the Soviet intelligence. It turned out that the intelligence did not come from the Soviets, but was broadcast from Hawkinstown. After learning such crucial information, the trio didn't contact the police station. Hopper sat in the restaurant, patiently waiting for Joyce to join him for their date. But Joyce was nowhere to be seen. In truth, she had completely forgotten about their date and was busy conducting an experiment at her son's teacher's house. The teacher had set up an electromagnetic field at home to explain to Joyce why the magnets had stopped working. They deduced that it was due to the interference of some type of electromagnetic field. However, Joyce's home and her workplace were quite far apart, and for the fridge magnets at both places to fail, it had to be related to some large alternating current transformer. 
However, this would require tens of billions of volts of electricity and cost tens of millions of dollars, something an ordinary person could not achieve. However, the warehouse where Billy had his accident did not contain an alternating current transformer. Although he went to work as usual that day, he seemed out of sorts. Mrs. Wheeler approached him to apologize for failing to meet him the previous night, but Billy, imagining knocking her out, warned her to stay away from him. Later, he went to his post at the swimming pool under the blazing sun. He fell asleep on the way, and when he woke up, his exposed arm had been severely sunburned, and his whole body was feverish. He quickly ran into the bathroom to take a cold shower, only to see several mysterious black lines appearing on his elbow. A female colleague came to check on him, but Billy, being delirious, misheard her say, Take me to him. Ignoring her protests, he kidnapped her and put her in the trunk of his car. After work, he drove to the warehouse and carried the unconscious woman into the basement. When she came to, she found herself in an abandoned warehouse. She struggled and screamed for help in a chicken voice. Although her mouth was sealed and she could not make a sound, Billy was not worried about attracting attention. He tore off the tape from her mouth and promised that it would be over soon. Suddenly, a monster emerged from the darkness, and a flesh vine extended from its body, lunging towards the terrified, screaming girl. On the other side, Eleven publicly declares she's breaking up with Mike, then takes Max back to the cabin in the woods. They hide in the room, whispering to each other, but she doesn't truly want to break up. She's doing this just to teach Mike a lesson about lying. Therefore, she secretly uses her powers to watch his actions. Unexpectedly, Mike doesn't seem to learn his lesson and considers himself the victim. At this time, Hopper, who was stood up, returns home drunk to find Eleven's door closed. He barges in, only to find Max inside instead of Mike. This makes him happy, and he lays on the sofa, popping open a bottle of champagne and watching a Daniel C.C. movie. To cheer up Eleven, the two girls play a game of spin the bottle. Whoever the bottle points at, Eleven has to use her powers to spy on. The second person it lands on is Max's stepbrother, Billy. Max assumes that her stepbrother is up to no good, but when Eleven enters her mind space, she finds Billy's car with a shattered windshield and Billy himself crouching on the ground. Near him, there are sounds of a girl screaming in fear. Just as Eleven gets closer, Billy turns around as if he has spotted her. Eleven gets scared and quickly pulls out of the mind space. The next day, Hopper wakes up from his drunken stupor to find Eleven gone. A note on the fridge claims she's spending the night at Max's house. Before Hopper can complain, someone knocks at the door. Joyce comes in with a bag of items, oblivious to Hopper's questions about standing him up the night before. She shows him a demagnetized fridge magnet and explains that she didn't go to dinner because she was researching the demagnetization issue with a teacher. Hopper, in a fit of jealousy, doesn't listen to her and assumes that Joyce was attracted to the teacher's charm and enjoyed a candlelight dinner at his house. Joyce, helpless, states that the demagnetization event occurred twice, once at her house and once at the supermarket where she works. The two places are far apart, and only a machine that creates a large magnetic field can achieve such an effect but this requires a lot of resources and money. The only ones in the small town with this capability are the people at the energy lab. Joyce suspects that those people are back, and she wants Hopper to take her to check it out. Hopper initially disagrees, but when he goes back to his room to change clothes, Joyce grabs some tools and decides to investigate on her own. Seeing this, Hopper has no choice but to agree. Meanwhile, Max is still comforting Eleven, thinking that the scream she heard might be a sound of pleasure. But they still go to Billy's room to confirm what happened. They find no sign of Billy or any girl. Instead, they see a bathtub full of melted ice bags and bloodstains on the sink cabinet. Inside the basket, there's a first aid kit and a bloody whistle. The whistle is custom made from the swimming pool, so they go there to ask questions. At this moment, a sudden downpour causes the pool to close and people to leave. There are two staff members on duty at the front desk who stop Eleven from entering, but they inform her that the first aid kit belongs to a girl named Heather, who had the day off along with Billy. Eleven sees Heather's photo on the employee wall, which means she can find her based on that. When the staff members aren't looking, Eleven and Max sneak into the swimming pool bathhouse. Sure enough, they find Heather. She is behind a red door, and when she opens it, there's a bathtub full of ice. Heather screams for help, but is quickly dragged into an abyss, disappearing before Eleven's eyes. 
Over at the energy lab, Hopper and Joyce have just arrived. The place has been sealed off and stands as an abandoned building. The windows have been shattered and left glass shards scattered everywhere. It's clear that no one has been here for a long time. The pair make their way to the area of the incident, inspecting the wall that once connected to the upside down. To their surprise, they find no breaches. After Eleven sealed the gate to the upside down, the government had sent people to repaint the walls, with Hopper himself overseeing the work. He had been confident that the strange occurrences had ended, but both of them can't help but feel a lingering unease, often haunted by the memories of that time. Hopper had once almost shot a neighbor's dog, mistaking it for a monster due to a trick of the eye. He never let on, wanting to maintain a sense of safety for those around him. Just as Hopper tries to comfort Joyce with his experiences, they hear a strange noise from inside the building, as if something has been knocked over. He rushes off towards the sound, only to be ambushed in an empty room. He is overpowered and knocked unconscious. By the time Joyce arrives, the attacker has already fled on a Tesla motorcycle. On the kids' side, Nancy's clue involves the discovery that many shops and farms have been infested with rats, and a large amount of fertilizer has been stolen. She plans to utilize the power of the newspaper to publicize this issue, but her superiors don't take it seriously, rebuking her for overstepping her role and telling her not to touch the phone. Annoyed, Nancy decides to present tangible evidence. She and Jonathan head to Mrs. Driscoll's house straight after work. To their surprise, they find the door unlocked and no one answers their knock. Fearing that the elderly woman might have fallen, they enter the house, only to discover the horrifying sight of the 80-year-old woman gorging on a bag of fertilizer in the basement. They quickly call an ambulance, but even as the paramedics take her away, Mrs. Driscoll is still screaming to be let go, her frantic behavior not befitting an elderly lady. Elsewhere, Robin is still decoding the Russian message. Meanwhile, Steve and Dustin aren't taking things seriously, leaving all the work at the ice cream shop to Robin and using a telescope to observe people, trying to identify a spy. They start tailing a man with sunglasses, only to find out he's just a fitness trainer. On the other hand, Robin makes a breakthrough. While she's resting in the shop, a delivery man comes by. Looking at his uniform, she finally understands the meaning of the code. The delivery company's logo is a cat, corresponding to the silver cat in the code. She realizes the other words should also have corresponding answers in the mall. After careful observation, she finally solves the riddle. It turns out a shipment is to be delivered to the mall at 9 p.m. After their shift, the three of them stake out the location and indeed spot a few fully armed men moving goods. Unfortunately, they attract the attention of a security guard. With no weapons at their disposal, they have no choice but to retreat. Cracking the code was child's play. The real disaster has already descended upon the town. Eleven and Max ventured out in the rain to Heather's house. They discovered her front door was conspicuously red. However, when they rushed inside, there were no screams of a family in mourning. Instead, they found Heather's parents dining with Billy. Heather herself appeared, holding a baked cookie, a happy smile on her face. This left the two girls stunned, not knowing why Heather, who cried out for help in the void, was now at peace with Billy. Billy didn't seem to notice Eleven's confusion. Instead, he was interested in her, asking her name and why she was there. Max made up an excuse and quickly pulled Eleven away. However, after they left, Billy stared after Eleven, his mind filled with memories of the Mind Flayer. He knew it was Eleven who had closed the gate to the Upside Down. Shortly after, Heather's parents met a grim fate. Her mother was drugged and fell unconscious. Her father, the editor of the newspaper and Nancy's boss, thought his wife was suddenly ill and was about to call an ambulance when he was knocked out by a blow from a wine bottle wielded by his daughter, Heather. Will, far away at the secret base, felt a disturbance and told Mike and Lucas that it was back. Eleven, returning home, also felt something was wrong, but she and Max couldn't figure out what exactly. Heather's parents woke up later in an abandoned warehouse. They pleaded with their daughter for mercy, but instead of being released, their gags were removed. Just as they were on the brink of despair, a gigantic figure emerged from the darkness. It's the Mind Flayer, now in physical form. It unleashed two tendrils that covered their faces, pumping something into them. The next day, Hopper, who had been unconscious all night, finally woke up. He found himself naked in front of Joyce, which made them both feel awkward. 
However, Joyce had not taken advantage of his vulnerability. His clothes were just soaked from the rain and she had no choice but to undress him. She quickly changed the subject and started talking about the person who had attacked them the previous night. Although they didn't know who that person was, Joyce remembered the license plate number of the motorcycle. This reminded Hopper that he had seen a motorcyclist when he helped the mayor drive away the townspeople from a meeting. Hopper immediately went to question the mayor. The mayor initially tried to deny knowing anything about the motorcyclist, but Hopper knew the man had come out of the mayor's office. The connection was undeniable, so Hopper decided to use force. After threatening to cut off one of his fingers, the mayor confessed that he didn't know the man's name, only that he worked for the boss of Starcourt Mall. The mayor confessed that the boss had bribed him to force the townspeople to sell him their lands for building the mall. Hopper didn't quite believe the mayor's words and asked him to produce the transaction records. These were kept in a safe at the mayor's house, so he had to take them there. It turned out the mayor wasn't lying. The safe contained land transaction documents. Joyce took a look and noticed all the land deeds were near Jordan Lake, right where there was a power station. That could explain why there had been sudden power cuts and several demagnetization incidents in the town. It turned out the boss was stealing electricity to power a magnetic field machine. No wonder they had found nothing at the energy lab. Hopper and Joyce decided to go check it out, but in order to prevent the mayor from tipping anyone off, they tied him up before leaving. Meanwhile, upon learning that the Mind Flayer has reappeared, Mike urgently calls Max and Eleven to convene in his basement to discuss a plan of action. Dustin is also contacted, but he's too busy watching the enemy's movements, waiting for an opportunity to infiltrate their ranks. He's investigating what the spies are up to in the courier warehouse, and thus doesn't have time to listen to his walkie-talkie. Despite his long surveillance, he finds that the enemy is well guarded with tight security and armed support. The door can only be opened with an access card, making a direct breach impossible. Robin, looking at the ventilation duct of the workshop, suddenly comes up with an idea. She buys a blueprint of the mall and discovers that they can reach the spy's secret room via the ventilation duct. However, the duct is too small. Even Dustin can't fit in, let alone Robin and Steve. After much consideration, they turn their gaze towards Erica, who is just the right size. She agrees to help, but only if she gets a lifetime VIP card for free desserts. Steve readily agrees, but they decide to wait until nightfall to execute the plan. On the other side, Nancy and Jonathan are sitting in the newspaper office, stunned. They've made a big blunder. Although they took Mrs. Driscoll to the hospital and called the police, they're now being sued by the old lady's children. On hearing this, their editor-in-chief is furious and fires them both. The editor has a bandage on his forehead. He's sweating profusely, but he acts normally, as if last night's kidnapping never happened. Nancy and Jonathan don't notice this because they're upset about losing their jobs. Jonathan only wanted to earn money to support his family, and he didn't expect to lose his job because of Nancy's stubbornness. They have a big argument and part on bad terms. Nancy returns home distraught, locking herself in her room. Mrs. Wheeler, noticing that her daughter isn't acting normal, takes the initiative to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her. After a dose of motherly advice, Nancy regains her confidence and decides to continue her investigation, planning to visit Mrs. Driscoll in the hospital that night. Mike, Eleven, and the others meet up, and Will shares his experiences. He's been feeling a sense of weightlessness, as if his body has been taken away. This only happened before when the Mind Flayer was nearby, so he suspects it's on the loose in town again. The part that his mother forced out of him might have been sealed, but perhaps a part of it still remains in his body. Now, the gang dares not take any risks and has to prepare for the worst. If the Mind Flayer really has reappeared, it will definitely look for a new host. Eleven thinks Billy might be its next host, because his ice baths at home fit with the Mind Flayer's preference for the cold, but the Mind Flayer can hide its outer appearance, making it impossible to tell. So although they suspect Billy, they can't confirm it even after staking out the swimming pool. Frustrated, Mike comes up with an idea to lure Billy into the sauna room. They'll then crank up the heat, as the Mind Flayer can't handle high temperatures and will reveal its true form. Therefore, the group of five get their tools ready and wait until the swimming pool closes before they begin their plan. Billy is taking a shower in the bathroom when he suddenly hears the door open. Irritated, he goes to investigate but finds no one there. Yet, he hears someone calling his name. But Billy is not scared. He follows the sound to the sauna room, where he finds a dummy with a tape recorder. Eleven and the others then appear, trapping Billy in the sauna room. They lock the door with an iron bar and chain and turn up the sauna's heat. At the same time, Nancy pretends to be Mrs. Driscoll's granddaughter to fool the on-duty nurse and visit her. Mrs. Driscoll is still asleep. 
Nancy takes this opportunity to copy her medical records. Unexpectedly, a sleeping Mrs. Driscoll is in pain. Her heart beats intensely and her body temperature is rising. This is due to Billy being locked in the sauna. As the temperature inside rises, Billy becomes agitated. Her stepsister feels guilty, but she's seen the terrifying monster and knows the harm of the Mind Flayer. Therefore, even though Billy cries and begs, Max does not let him out. However, while he's trying to persuade Billy, Will senses the Mind Flayer has appeared. Mike immediately yells for everyone to move away from the door. Then, Billy uses a shard of tile to break the glass in the door. Lucas quickly fires his slingshot, but this attack only angers the Mind Flayer. It possesses Billy, causing Mrs. Driscoll in the hospital to also suffer immensely. Faced with a stronger Billy, Eleven barely escapes thanks to Mike's distraction, which gives Eleven a chance to use all her power to slam Billy against the wall, creating a hole. However, the monster doesn't wish to fight any longer and quickly retreats. Although Billy has failed, there are countless others like him, townsfolk whose minds have been taken over by the Mind Flayer, all waiting for commands in an abandoned warehouse. Over at the mall, which has now closed, Erica begins her mission through the ventilation ducts. She's swift and efficient, making her way into the Russian agent's secret room in just a few minutes. She opens the secret room door and Steve and the others who have been hiding nearby quickly enter through the door. They open a delivery box to find a cooler box inside filled with vials of green liquid. They prepare to leave with the evidence, but just then, the secret room shakes. The door button fails and the entire room starts to descend, causing the four of them to cry out in fear. Unexpectedly, it turns out to be an elevator shaft. They are now trapped inside and find no way out. They ascend through the top maintenance entrance, only to see a deep hole above. Now, their only option is to use a room key to open the door. Meanwhile, when the town mayor's wife returns home late, he doesn't ask to be untied, but demands his phone to make a call. Hopper and Joyce, unaware that their location has been exposed, are currently searching near Jordan Lake, looking for the electromagnetic machine. The two of them have investigated several buildings and finally arrive at a residential house. It seems to have been vacant for a long time as there's little furniture inside, but the lights in the house are flickering. Joyce hears noises coming from underneath and as she listens carefully, she sees light from under a bed. Guessing that the bed is a secret mechanism, she lifts it up and indeed finds a secret passage. Inside the passage, Hopper encounters two Soviets. Neither side speaks the other's language, leading to a heated exchange. Just then, Joyce notices dust falling from the ceiling, indicating someone has entered the room. It is the motorcyclist hitman summoned by the mayor. The hitman enters the passage and looks around but doesn't see the intruders. As he's pondering the situation, Hopper sneaks up behind him and points a gun at his head. Hopper plans to take the man into custody, but the hitman thinks that Hopper won't shoot. In the ensuing scuffle, Hopper wounds his leg, handcuffs a Russian scientist, and flees the scene with Joyce in a car. But the car breaks down halfway, and Hopper fiddles with it until dawn with no progress. By the time they manage to restart the car, it breaks down completely. They're far from Hawkins Town and are forced to trek through the forest to seek help from a friend of Hopper. The scene then shifts to Eleven. The group learns that the Mind Flayer is back and wants to contact Hopper to strategize, but he's gone out with Joyce. They also try to reach Dustin but can't find him. Mike is frustrated and has a heated argument with his friends. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. It's Nancy and Jonathan. Nancy noticed something strange about Mrs. Driscoll last night and stayed at the hospital until dawn to monitor her. She suspects it has something to do with the upside down and called Jonathan early in the morning, hoping to find Will who had been previously possessed. To convince the group, Nancy brings Mrs. Driscoll's medical records and explains that the old woman's symptoms are consistent with Will's previous illness. Moreover, when Mrs. Driscoll started acting strangely last night, the group was using the sauna to deal with Billy. This proves Will's claim that the Mind Flayer is back, and this time it's more brazen with more than one victim. Eleven remembers Heather, who must also be a victim. Nancy knows that Heather is the daughter of the newspaper's editor, so they pay a visit to the editor's home. They find the house in chaos, with a lot of chemicals emptied out and fresh blood on the floor. Recalling the plaster on the editor's head from the day before, Nancy suspects he was attacked. They follow the blood trail, but only find a piece of rope used for tying people up, indicating that the victims had been moved to somewhere else. Nancy deduces that the Mind Flayer must have a lair where it turns its victims into the Flayed, a place Eleven hasn't seen yet. If they can find it, they might be able to stop the Mind Flayer from wreaking havoc without having to worry about why they eat chemicals. Will suggests letting Mrs. Driscoll go and tailing her to the monster's lair. 
At that moment, Dustin was still trying to make contact with the outside world via radio, but the elevator was too deep underground for the signal to transmit. Steve told him to focus on more pressing matters. Just as they were settling down, they heard someone approaching from outside. They quickly hid, watching as two Russian agents swiped their cards and entered, taking away several boxes of goods. As they drove away, Steve used a green canister to block the exit while the door was still open. They rolled out, and eventually the green canister was crushed, and its liquid contents spilled out, instantly corroding the ground. Ahead of them was a deep tunnel. The group entered the tunnel and reached the main camp, where they encountered patrolling guards. Erica spotted the communication room. She guessed it was where coded messages were sent, so the four of them used some equipment as cover and easily broke in. Inside was a lone communication officer. Steve charged at them with a shout, knocked the officer out with a flurry of moves. Behind the communication room was a lab where they saw a group of workers in protective suits pouring the green liquid into a particle accelerator, blasting open a door into a parallel universe on the wall. On the other side, the hitman had caught up with Hopper's car. Although he didn't see any figures, he found footprints on the nearby ground. Hopper didn't think to erase their tracks. He and Joyce hadn't rested since the night before and had been hiking for hours. They were tired and hungry. They could only bicker with each other to keep their spirits up. But while they were having their sweet disagreement, the scientist took the opportunity to run. Hopper quickly followed, unaware that the scientist wasn't trying to escape but had spotted a gas station store and was leading Hopper there to shop. The three of them grabbed drinks and gulped them down. When Hopper paid, he saw an old man filling up outside and came up with a plan. He used the handcuffs, commandeered the old man's car under the guise of transporting a dangerous prisoner, and sped off, leaving the old man stunned. The hitman caught up quickly, learned what had happened from the cashier, but he had to stop the pursuit without his Tesla motorcycle. Hopper drove off to find the investigating reporter, who had used public pressure to force the government to shut down the energy lab in last season. The reporter spoke a little Russian, so Hopper wanted him to serve as a translator to extract information about the scientist's work. While the adults were going on their adventures, the kids had run into danger. They went to the hospital as planned to find Mrs. Driscoll. Because the front desk nurse was monitoring, they only allowed two people to visit the patient's room. So only Nancy and Jonathan went upstairs, while the others stayed on the first floor to wait for news. The two of them apologized to each other in the elevator. Mike on the first floor also wanted to make amends with Eleven, but the Mind Flayer would not be moved by such sentiment. By the time Jonathan and Nancy found Mrs. Driscoll's room, there was no one left inside. Even the nurse had disappeared. Then, a man with blood-stained hands appeared behind them. It was the kidnapped editor. Jonathan pulled Nancy and ran just as they ran into his transformed co-worker, blocking their way to the elevator. They had to take a detour, passing several bodies lying in a pool of blood. Nancy tried to contact the front desk, but the phone line was busy. They were easily caught up with, and Jonathan was beaten up. In a critical moment, Nancy used surgical scissors to distract the enemy and hid in another room. But after she lured the co-worker away, Jonathan fell into the editor's hands and was brutally beaten again, nearly losing his shitty life. Luckily, Nancy was quick thinking. She used a fire extinguisher to hit the co-worker controlled by the Mind Flayer. When he was knocked out, the editor also fainted. Jonathan stabbed him in the neck with scissors. But even though they delivered a fatal blow, the two bodies didn't die. The hospital lights flickered, and the bodies trembled before exploding into a puddle of flesh. Nancy and Jonathan were stunned as they watched the two piles of flesh merge into one monstrous form, a spider-like creature of the Upside Down. It then roared like a goose and flexed its monstrous figure and muscles. Will sensed the presence of the Mind Flayer, but he couldn't pinpoint its exact location. Meanwhile, a panicked Nancy was fleeing, seeking refuge in a room that was still under renovation. She thought she would be safe if she locked the door. But to her horror, the creature could disintegrate into a sludge-like substance and seep through the door cracks. Outside, Jonathan was helpless, watching in dread as Nancy was about to fall victim to the Mind Flayer. In the nick of time, Eleven came to the rescue. With a show of her telekinetic powers, she attacked the creature, hurling it in every direction like an adult toy. Then, she pushed it out the window. Unexpectedly, even that didn't kill the creature. It transformed back into sludge, slipped into the sewer, and returned to the Mind Flayer's main body. Seeing that, Billy told Heather that it was time. The next day was the 4th of July Independence Day in the United States. The town mayor was mobilizing his staff, eager to set the festive atmosphere for the evening. Just then, the hitman confronted him about the ongoing search for Hopper. 
The mayor tried to deflect blame, but the hitman grabbed him by the collar to chastise him, forcing the mayor to promise to find Hopper out within the day. Meanwhile, Hopper had taken a risk and gone shopping, buying burgers and drinks to bring back. These were all things the scientist had asked for, promising to give information in return for good food and drink. However, because Hopper had bought the wrong flavor of drink, the scientist refused to cooperate. Hopper lost his temper and threw the handcuffs and car keys at him, demanding he buy his own drinks. This move puzzled everyone else. They assumed the scientist would escape, but when he unlocked his handcuffs and started the car to leave, he surprisingly returned. It turned out Hopper had figured out the scientist's thoughts. If he returned to his Russian base unharmed, he would likely be treated as a leak and punished. It was better to stay with Hopper, enjoy good food and drinks and trade information, so he confessed that last year they had tried to open the gate to the Upside Down using an electromagnetic cannon, but failed. The scientists deduced that the cannon wasn't the problem, but rather the location was wrong, so they targeted Hawkins Town, where the gate to the Upside Down had once been opened. Although it was sealed, it still existed. So they conducted the experiments in the town, and that explains why the fridge magnets had demagnetized previously. Joyce and Hopper were startled, fearing a repeat of the tragedy. One rushed to contact the team, while the other wanted to take the scientist to shut down the electromagnetic cannon. However, the scientist expressed difficulty. He could help Hopper, but the cannon was in a heavily guarded underground fortress. Outsiders couldn't easily infiltrate it, let alone access its control panel. Unbeknownst to him, the fortress had already been breached by the kids. Steve and his crew were observing the cannon, but they didn't expect the communications officer behind them to wake up and call the guards. Steve and Robin were caught on the spot. Dustin and Erica, under their cover, crawled into the ventilation ducts and escaped. Dustin wanted to crawl out and get help, but Erica estimated that it would take them at least 13 days to crawl out. By that time, they would likely starve to death on the way. It would be better to go back to base to save people. Steve and Robin were beaten but stubbornly kept their secrets. Seeing that physical coercion was futile, the Russian chief decided to employ chemical means. He locked Steve and Robin together and went to find a doctor to administer a drug that caused mental excitement. Robin, who had feelings for Steve, confessed about the code. Steve also revealed that Dustin and Erica knew about it. But as they were messing things up, the two kids had already devised a rescue plan. Red alarms rang out in the fortress. When the chief went to investigate, he saw that the floor had been corroded by a green liquid, leaving a large hole. Just then, Dustin stormed in with a stun gun and took down the doctor. He quickly untied Steve and Robin. Meanwhile, learning that the bunker was guarded by the military, Hopper risked exposure and called Dr. Sam, the person in charge of the energy lab. He requested his assistance and then returned to Hawkins with the scientist. Meanwhile, Eleven found herself in the realm of consciousness, attempting to locate the lair of the Mind Flayer. She had the known victim's photos spread out before her and kept herself sequestered in her room, repeating her psychic rituals. Nancy and Jonathan made calls using the phone book, trying to see if anything else had gone missing, hoping to discern a pattern in the monster's movements. The results were unexpected. Previously, the town had seen a large quantity of fertilizer and chemicals stolen, but that was no longer the case. It seemed the monsters were no longer stealing, but why had they stopped eating? Will speculated that once flayed and transformed into monsters, they no longer needed chemical sustenance. However, if all the infected had become monsters, why couldn't Eleven find them? Mike wasn't worried about this, but rather was concerned about Eleven overusing her powers, fearing it could harm her health. He urged everyone to come up with a new plan, not to rely too much on Eleven. The others disagreed with him, believing Eleven knew what she was doing. Their job was simply to trust her. To ease Mike's worries, Eleven moved her rituals to the living room. This time, her target was Billy. However, he hadn't gone out on Independence Day. Rather, he sat at home as if he was expecting someone. This made the team hesitant to make a move, fearing a potential trap. As they argued, Eleven noticed a rainbow on a cereal box, reminding her of when she found her mother last year. She learned about their separation through a handshake. Suddenly, she had a plan. Perhaps if she shook hands with Billy in the realm of consciousness, she might find out where he went and thus locate the Mind Flayer's hideout. Despite her fear of Billy, she entered the realm of consciousness and reached out for Billy's hand. In the split second their hands touched, Billy was somehow aware of Eleven's presence. He grabbed her wrist and she struggled to break free and fell backward. In that moment, she saw Billy's demise flash before her eyes. Then, she was lying on a beach. 
This was actually Billy's deepest memory, a young Billy surfing with his birth mother in California, his face beaming with happiness. But not far away, storm clouds were gathering. As Eleven approached, she saw the fluff that only exists in the upside down floating in the sky. Billy's father was scolding him in the wind, calling him a coward who only knew how to run away. Eleven rushed over and saw Billy's father beating his son. Unable to endure it, the mother chose to divorce, and from then on, Billy became a well-known bully. Not long after, his father remarried, this time to Max's mother. When Eleven entered the Vortex's center, she heard Billy's final screams. She saw Billy's car parked in front of an abandoned steel mill, which was actually the hideout of the Mind Flayer. Then, Jonathan found the address in the contact list and realized that it was very close to the cabin. Eleven disconnected from the realm of consciousness, but when she took off her blindfold, she didn't see Mike. Instead, she saw a figure emerging from the bedroom. It was Billy, who had been waiting for a long time. Apparently, Eleven was discovered by the Mind Flayer, and all the monsters knew she was in the cabin. The infected people, one by one, walked into the steel mill on the night of Independence Day, when the fireworks were in full bloom. Meanwhile, the possessed Billy was intimidating Eleven, saying he built it all to deal with her. Once her life was ended, everyone would be finished. Scared, Eleven managed to disconnect from the realm of consciousness. The infected who entered the steel mill decomposed into a pulp and then merged into the body of the Mind Flayer. The physical Mind Flayer was formed with a large number of rats and humans, its body swelling until it burst through the floor and crawled out of the ground. When the Mind Flayer created a giant spider monster, the town was still a scene of peace and celebration. Nancy's parents took their little daughter on the Ferris wheel. They bribed the staff to stop them at the highest point, hoping to find a good view to watch the fireworks prepared by the mayor for Independence Day. However, as the couple was excited about the fireworks, their daughter noticed that the trees in the forest seemed to be moving inexplicably. At this moment, Eleven and the others were still discussing what the Mind Flayer had built. Suddenly, they heard a beast's low roar from the forest. Will sensed that the Mind Flayer knew where they were hiding, so everyone rushed out, only to see a spider-like creature coming towards them. Nancy took a shotgun and, along with the others, locked the doors and windows. Then, everyone gathered in the center of the living room to face the impending attack. Unfortunately, they were not well prepared and the cabin's defense was not good enough. The spider monster's tendrils easily pierced the walls. Jonathan and Nancy quickly picked up weapons, but it was to no avail. They had to rely on Eleven and her superpowers. But she was outnumbered, and although she managed to deal with four tendrils at once, she didn't notice the roof. The other tendril attacked from above, wrapping around Eleven's ankle and pulling her heavy body out. The team rushed forward to grab Eleven's hand. Nancy simultaneously attacked with bullets, while Lucas picked up an axe and chopped the tendril. Finally, he cut it off. But the tendril had barbs and was covered in tiny teeth, which were embedded in Eleven's flesh. When Mike pulled it out and threw it away, it could still move quickly to escape. Eleven's leg was bleeding profusely, but she had to use her power to tear the spider monster in half. Subsequently, everyone quickly drove off, seeking refuge in a supermarket in town. Inside, they found emergency medical supplies to stop Eleven's bleeding and dress her wound. Max had experience in this, having helped her stepbrother on many occasions. She then found things to stop the bleeding, then cleaned and bandaged the wound. Lucas and Will were a bit confused, searching everywhere for a bowl to hold clean water. They suddenly discovered a shelf full of fireworks. Each firework contained gunpowder, and if detonated together, it could have the power of a bomb. Lucas thought of using it against the spider monster, so he and Will packed them all to take with them. Meanwhile, Mike stayed by Eleven's side. He apologized for their previous breakup and tried to express his feelings. Just then, the walkie-talkie rang out, instantly ruining the smelly moment. The voice of Dustin came through the walkie-talkie. It turned out that Dustin and Erica had stolen a cart from the bunker and had also gotten an access card. They took advantage of the chaos and escaped the same way they came, taking Steve and Robin with them and leaving the bunker via the elevator. Dustin had planned to escape in Steve's car, but his keys had been taken. With enemies pursuing them from behind, Dustin had no choice but to hide in the crowded cinema. Later, he left the other three enjoying the Daniel C.C. movie and went to the projection room to contact Mike. But his walkie-talkie battery was low and the signal was weak. Mike could not hear what he was saying. Dustin returned to his seat in despair, only to find that Steve and Robin were gone. They hadn't gone far, just outside to drink water and quench their thirst. They were laughing at the ceiling lights, but soon both of them started feeling dizzy and ran to the bathroom to throw up. 
Back at the supermarket, Eleven used her superpowers to locate Dustin and found them at the cinema in the mall. Thus, she prepared to meet Dustin with the fireworks. However, after they left the supermarket, the place where Eleven cleaned her wound started moving. The flayed Billy quickly found the supermarket, but he was a step too late. The group had already disappeared. At the same time, Hopper and Joyce were rushing back to town. The scientist was still discussing how to destroy the electromagnetic cannon. To shut down the system, two keys stored in a safe were needed, and the safe's password was Planck's constant. But the reporter paid not too much attention to this famous number. When they reached the town, Hopper and Joyce went to the amusement park to find the kids, leaving the reporter and the scientist in the car. However, the mayor saw Hopper and quickly called the hitman. As the scientist finalized the plan to detonate the cannon and the reporter took him to experience local activities, the hitman appeared. He despised the scientist's betrayal and shot him in the abdomen. The reporter rushed to help, but he had no medical skills or supplies, so he had to call Hopper for help. Seeing the enemies closing in, Hopper asked Joyce and the reporter to take the scientist and drive away while he distracted the enemies himself. But he was a step too late, and the Russian scientist died from blood loss. Hopper ran into a haunted house, quickly dealing with an enemy. But he knew he was no match for the hitman. He grabbed the enemy's gun and walkie-talkie and hid in a room full of mirrors, easily dealing with the hitman using the terrain. However, the hitman was wearing a bulletproof vest, and Hopper didn't aim for his head. With the hitman's backup arriving, Hopper didn't dare to continue the fight and had to make a run for it. On Joyce's way out, she saw the mayor, marched up to him, and gave him a good thrashing. Afterwards, she got into her car and drove off to meet with the others. Hopper had finally managed to break through the siege. At this moment, some Russian words came over the walkie-talkie. The reporter could understand bits and pieces of it and realized that the Russian agents had found the children's hiding spot, which was on the first floor of the mall. Inside the mall, Dustin and Erica found Steve and Robin. They had planned to blend into the crowd and leave, but every exit was guarded. The four of them had no choice but to hide behind a bar. However, they were still discovered by patrolling agents. In the nick of time, a car's horn sounded in the hall. It turned out that Eleven and the others had arrived. With Eleven's powers, the car suddenly launched at the enemy, knocking them unconscious. With this, the whole group was finally gathered. They excitedly exchanged information, but in the midst of their discussions, Eleven fell into extreme pain. She clutched her leg in agony, shouting about the pain in her leg. Mike and the others quickly examined her leg injury, only to find the leg bitten by the spider monster was severely swollen, with signs of festering and decay. There were also bugs moving under her skin. Witnessing Eleven's screams of pain, Will decided to risk extracting the bugs. He got a knife from his father's restaurant, sterilized it with fire, and had Eleven bite down on a spoon. But when Will cut open the skin, he didn't have surgical tweezers. He reached into her flesh with his fingers. The sight made him and the others cringe in fear. In the end, Eleven had to stop him. She braced herself against the intense pain, using her powers to draw out whatever was under her skin and threw it far away. Only then did everyone see what the bug truly was. It was not a parasite, but a piece of flesh from the spider monster, which could still move. But as the piece of flesh tried to escape, a giant foot came down from the sky and squashed it. It turned out that Hopper and the others had arrived. Now that the group was finally assembled, they managed to piece together the truth of the strange events. It's revealed that the electromagnetic cannon was being activated to open the gate to the Upside Down, allowing the Mind Flayer to return to the town to destroy America, infecting rats and humans everywhere, and creating the giant spider monster to deal with Eleven. To end this battle, they could only turn off and destroy the electromagnetic gun. This would cause the gate to the Upside Down to lose its magnetic field support and automatically close, sending the Mind Flayer back to the Upside Down. The adults wanted the children to rest and planned to infiltrate the bunker according to the map left by the scientist. They didn't expect to be ridiculed by 10-year-old Erica, who claimed they were recklessly walking into a death trap. Even Dustin expressed his discontent, for he had survived the bunker and memorized its ventilation and pipeline map. Hopper had no choice but to give Dustin a walkie-talkie to act as a guide. However, the radio signals from outside the bunker were blocked. To communicate with the outside world, they had to use the agent's radio tower as a relay, which required another powerful tower. 
Luckily, Dustin had a Cerebro, which was located on a mountaintop in the town. Therefore, Steve was tasked to take Dustin and Erica to the mountaintop, while the adults infiltrated the bunker according to his remote command. The others were to find a hiding place. They bid each other a brief farewell before starting their respective missions. Dustin's group was heading to the mountaintop, Hopper's group entered the elevator, and the other kids got into Nancy's car to hide in the reporter's base, but Nancy's car wouldn't start because the ignition cable had disappeared. As they were worrying, a car's high beam shone from the front. The person in the car was Billy, who had followed the blood trail. He saw Eleven, which meant the Mind Flayer knew about the group. They quickly hid in the mall. Mike tried to contact Dustin for backup with the walkie-talkie, but Dustin's group was still climbing the mountain and couldn't receive the Cerebro's signal. Nancy noticed an abandoned car in the mall, thinking that the ignition cable should still be inside. However, Eleven had overturned the car before, and they had to push it back upright to open the hood. Eleven tried to use her powers to do this, but surprisingly it didn't work. They had no choice but to push it manually. Meanwhile, Hopper's group was still discussing their plan. They wanted to sneak in, but when the elevator door opened, several armed guards were standing outside. While the reporter distracted them with Russian, Hopper took them out from the side. They then disguised themselves in the guards' uniforms and drove a decoy car into the bunker's headquarters. Despite the increased security, the reporter managed to fool the guards and found the entrance to the ventilation duct that Dustin had mentioned. At this time, Dustin's group had just reached the mountaintop. They quickly exchanged code words to ensure the plan was on schedule. Now, only the reporter could fit into the ventilation duct. He had to create a diversion to distract the guards, allowing Hopper and Joyce to go to the safe and retrieve the key box to the electromagnetic cannon. At the mall, the kids had worked together to upright the car, but Eleven found her powers had disappeared. Worse, just as Will had taken out the ignition cable, the spider monster had found them. At the same time, the hitman returned to the bunker with his subordinates and found his dead comrades at the entrance, guessing that the intruders had broken in. Hopper was worried, and Joyce promised him that they would go on a sweet date once everything was over, effectively confessing to each other. Meanwhile, the reporter was crawling around in the ventilation duct according to Dustin's instructions. Steve noticed that the mall's lights were flickering from the mountaintop, which scared Dustin into contacting Mike via radio. But Mike had left his walkie-talkie in the hall. Seeing no response, Steve and Robin quickly drove back. At this point, the rest of the kids were hiding in the mall. The spider monster was huge, but its vision wasn't good, so they hadn't been discovered yet. However, it was only a matter of time before they were found. Eleven knew there was an exit here, so she and the two ran for it. Lucas used his slingshot from the side to cover them, buying time for Eleven to escape while Jonathan was fixing the ignition cable. At the same time, Nancy led the others to run outside, but they found that Billy hadn't left. Their whereabouts had been discovered by the Mind Flayer. Just as Billy drove to hit Nancy, a convertible suddenly collided with him. It was Steve who had rushed back. Billy fainted on the spot, but the spider monster chased them from behind. Everyone had no choice but to drive away in panic. At the same time, the reporter finally located the power control center. Using the drawings from the Russian scientist, he quickly shut down the bunker's circuit breaker, plunging it into a brief power outage. As the guards scrambled, Hopper and Joyce sprang into action, running for the secret room housing the safe. Just as they were making progress, the safe's password the reporter provided was incorrect. Given that this isn't something the average person would know, they had to rely on their outside help, Dustin. In desperation, Dustin quickly contacted his girlfriend, a genius girl living in Salt Lake City. He asked her to get planks constant, but the girl didn't believe he was trying to save the world. She thought Dustin was playing a game with her and insisted they sing a duet together. Reluctantly, Dustin sang along and everyone heard their duet. Although it was awkward for everyone else, they had to silently endure this public display of affection. After the duet concluded, the girl gave them planks constant, allowing Hopper to successfully open the safe. They then obtained the box containing the keys. At this moment, Billy woke up from his faint. He realized that Eleven was still at the mall and hadn't left with Nancy and the others. The Mind Flayer was aware of this and ordered the spider monster to turn back immediately. Billy also started chasing Eleven. Max tried to wake her possessed stepbrother up, but Billy, devoid of self-consciousness, was only interested in completing his master's task. He knocked them out in a few hits, took Eleven, and carried her off. Meanwhile, Hopper and Joyce entered the control room for the electromagnetic cannon. After chasing everyone out, they prepared to turn off the cannon with the keys. Both keys needed to be turned simultaneously, but as they inserted the keys into the keyholes, a countdown began. 
As expected, they were stopped by the hitman. Hopper got entangled in a muscle wrestling with him, but this conflict put Eleven in danger. Billy brought Eleven to the mall's main hall, waiting for her to wake up from her faint. As she came to, she saw the spider monster slowly approaching her, extending its vine-like tendrils from its mouth toward her. Just as the monster was about to reach her, fireworks suddenly lit up the hall. It was Nancy and the others. They had noticed something was wrong with the monster and had turned back to help. Using the fireworks prepared by Lucas, they attacked the spider monster. As the monster roared in pain like a goose, so did Billy, but his will was strong. Seeing Eleven trying to escape, he pulled her heavy body back. Lucas's fireworks were running low. He quickly contacted Dustin, urging the adults to destroy the electromagnetic cannon. But Hopper was being beaten by the hitman, barely able to fight back. He was almost decapitated by the cannon's parts. Joyce was filled with worry. She had no choice but to hook one key with her belt and reach for the other. Inside the mall, Eleven remembered Billy's past with his mother, something deeply buried within his memory. She tried to wake him by using this. Surprisingly, it worked. As the last of the fireworks were launched by the group, Billy finally regained consciousness and tried to fight against the spider monster. However, he was overwhelmed by its tendrils. Each of them hit him straight in the abdomen, leaving him powerless to fight back. Screaming in pain, he was finally impaled by a tendril and sent to meet Jesus. On Hopper's side, he found a chance to retaliate against the hitman. Using unexpected strength, he threw the hitman into the cannon, reducing him to a pulp. But the fight was not over yet. Dustin urged them to seal the door. Joyce, hearing the urgent calls, knew time was running out. Looking at Hopper, who was still standing next to the cannon, she knew if she turned the keys, Hopper would die. But she also knew Hopper was prepared for this sacrifice. Despite her reluctance, she knew what had to be done. So she closed her eyes, turned the keys, and the bunker exploded immediately, causing the electromagnetic cannon to be shattered into pieces, and the gate to the upside down, without magnetic support, began to close. The Mind Flayer returned to its world, and the Spider Monster, no longer under its control, turned back into a pile of flesh. The team had once again saved the town, but the aftermath was devastating. Billy was dead, and Hopper disappeared in the explosion. When Dr. Sam arrived with reinforcements, all that was left was the wreckage of the battlefield. Will and Mike reunited with their mothers respectively, while Eleven couldn't find her adoptive father. She had lost a home again. Three months later, the events in Hawkins Town were widely reported. The corrupt mayor was ousted and arrested. Steve and Robin continued their summer jobs and found new work at the cinema. Everyone else helped Joyce pack her belongings. She planned to take the children and move away from the town filled with tragic memories to start a life in another city. Eleven, who lost her superpowers, became an ordinary girl. She chose to leave with Joyce instead of staying with Mike, despite still loving him. While packing Hopper's belongings, Joyce found a letter in his uniform. It was a speech Hopper wrote with Joyce's help to communicate with Eleven. Only now did Eleven understand from the letter that Hopper had been living in sorrow due to the death of his biological daughter. He always left food in a box in the forest on Christmas as a commemoration. Unexpectedly, Eleven took the food from there and thus walked into Hopper's life, bringing a ray of sunshine into his gloomy days. Hopper wanted to mend their relationship and fulfill his fatherly duties. Sadly, just as he was ready to strive for a better life, his life ended three months ago. Eleven couldn't stop crying after reading the letter, but life had to go on. She composed herself, said goodbye to everyone, and got into Joyce's car, ready to start a new life with her new family. Just as they thought life was back on track, in a base far away on the Kamchatka Peninsula in the Soviet Union, two soldiers took a prisoner from a cell and dragged him into a deep underground cell. Ignoring the prisoner's pleas, they opened a door in the cell, from which a creature resembling a demogorgon emerged, the monster from the first season. This lays the mysteries that need to be explained, and here ends season three of this drama. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.